Thank you very much. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be back in Maryland. I have such fond memories here. Um, appreciate the invitation from, from the organizers. Uh, can view this on, anyway, so um, uh, this is uh, joint work. Let's see, let's see if I got this working. Nope, okay. Uh, joint work with uh, Andreas Saat, Jan Svoboda, and Richard Wentworth. Um, and so what I'm gonna do structurally in the talk, just as a piece of theater art, is I have, um, uh, I have a certain amount of background that I want to review, and uh, I will do that on the slides. The slides that watch me rapidly go back through some material fairly impressed, and the, the idea is to maybe do it so that you're left with some basic notation and some impressions. And when I want to really start saying things, um, that, uh, that I want to convey, then I'll move to the chalkboard. And so this just saves me some time. And so mostly what I want to do to begin with is, um, is, is take Steve's very eloquent treatment of Higgs bundles and completely butcher them. So, and, and so that it's, uh, or butcher it, the treatment. Um, and, uh, uh, and that will form enough background so I can go on and explain the relationship between the objects that I care about. Okay, so, wrong way. Um, so, as usual, in, for about two-thirds of this conference, uh, S is a differentiable surface of genus 2 in which I'm going to put various structures. Uh, I'll be, uh, what I'm interested in is the character variety that Steve talked about, and other people have talked about, representations of the fundamental group of the surface into PSL2C up to um, conjugations of that representation of my PSL2C. So I'm interested in this topological object. Okay? And there's a number of ways of understanding that topological object, and I want to relate them. Um, to emphasize, here the representations may or may not be discrete. I don't care. There's no quotient manifold in the, in the setting. So I'll first uh, remind you or present a gauge theory perspective on the asymptotics of this object. Let me restrict, I'm interested in the asymptotics of this character variety. So I start with a gauge theory perspective. And then um, the objects that arise uh, called, are called limiting configurations. Uh, and, uh, but uh, it, PSL2C has a, uh, is the, uh, roughly the isometry group of hyperbolic space. So I want to interpret those gauge theoretic objects in terms of hyperbolic geometry. That's sort of the plan. Uh, so, let me recall Higgs bundles. So, I'm going to do a rapid re uh, reminder of Higgs bundles. In some, I'm going to do it in PSL2C. Uh, maybe I'll refer to PSLNC. Uh, Steve already did this very well. Uh, and uh, so, it'll be some sort of when it's easy to say the more general NC version, I'll do that, and sometimes I'll just stick with the PSL2C. First step, and in this, uh, I want to highlight this step because this is part of our motivation and maybe my motivation. I said I'm interested in understanding the asymptotics of this character variety, which is a topological object. What's my first step? Pick a Riemann surface. So uh, in the culture I was raised, you, you don't do that. Like if you want to study a topological object, you stay on the topological object. So this first ad hoc choice uh, is, uh, uh, is something we'll focus on. And so, so this ad hoc choice we have to interpret. And so the, as Steve pointed out, the a representation into PSL2C determines a flat uh, rank two bundle. That's just topology. And hence, if I have a rank two bundle, then I have a flat connection. So I've now trans translated my uh, topological representation into a connection language. So I have a flat connection. Now, the basic formula that Steve highlighted is governed by Hitchens equations. And so what um, I want to point out in these equations, and this is the impressionistic part, is that there's three terms. There's the flat connection on the left. So that has to do with topology. There's, uh, and this connection is going to be broken up into two bits. And this bit is going to be sort of like Duramish. Um, it should have to do with a with metric, and this part here is going to have to do with like a Dolbo theory, uh, like a, uh, with complex analysis. So, um, shoot, 
I'm not used to this yet. Wrong way. Here we go. So D is the flat connection. And to find A, what we do is on this flat, on this rank two bundle E, I look for a Hermitian metric on the bundle. So that's a metric on each fiber. And what's that? This is finding a metric on each fiber is the same thing as finding a map to the space of metrics. So for each point, I need a metric. So in each point, I look for a map to the space of metrics and then have pick out one point. So that's equivalent to a, to a equivariant map um, on the universal cover to the space of metrics on the Hermitian bundle. And the space of metrics is SL2C mod SU2. Um, and so here I'm going to reprise what I just said. The target's the space of Hermitian metrics on the fiber. And then, so now that I'm looking for a map to the space of metrics, I recognize that the space of metrics is a symmetric space, has a geometry. So since it has a geometry, I can look for a very good map, so or best map. So I'm going to look for a harmonic map to that space. And um, once I find the harmonic map, this, there's a uniqueness theorem involved because this is, has non-positive curvature, then I get a, an induced connection, induced unitary connection on the bundle, and I write that as A. So start with a flat bundle. Um, look for a good Hermitian metric. That gives another connection on the bundle, D plus A. Well, now I have two connections on the bundle. I have the original flat connection, and I have this sort of harmonic connection. Well, the difference between two connections is some other sort of tensor. And that tensor um, we can call psi in some language. That's the difference between the flat and the harmonic connection. And then, with respect to um, the Riemann surface structure and now the whole morphic structure on the bundle, we can look at the one zero part of that difference. That's, uh, and that will be the, uh, the Higgs field phi. Okay, so. Wait, can I just, can I just, yeah. Does that mean that this is A a one? A one is, is, is it takes value from one zero in the one zero space, the canonical bundle of the. No. It was the churn connection. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I. It's a churn connection. Okay, so then. Okay. Oops. Okay. Yeah, it has, it has a one zero part. The, right. The one zero part is the D bar for the whole morphic structure, and then there's the one zero is the churn connection altogether. A is locally. No. No. I mean, it's the unitary connection. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. So, this problem with going well. Um, uh, let's see. So I said. So uh, as I said, the harmonic matrix now produce the whole morphic structure on E, and in that structure, the harmonicity says that this one zero part of the difference of these of the flat connection, the unitary connection, is holomorphic. So there, these Hitchin equations, the self-duality equations, summarize the decomposition in this way, um, that the D, as I said, is flat. The H, the, um, the harmonic metric, is harmonic. And the uh, Higgs field is holomorphic. So uh, and the equations say that if you take any one of these three as input, maybe with a slight extra structure, you can find the other two. It's a summary of the equations. And a Higgs bundle, as Steve told us, is a, is a pair um, of, a, uh, of a holomorphic vector bundle and such a Higgs field, uh, which satisfies some sort of stability condition. The stability condition is enough to guarantee the solution to the Hitchin equations. Great. So uh, in the SL2C setting, phi has this form. Uh, 
So if I have the square root of, of the canonical bundle plus the uh, inverse square root of the canonical bundle, the phi has this form in good coordinates. And the coefficients of these characteristic polynomials are holomorphic k forms, in this case, holomorphic two forms for quadratic differentials. Um, so for rank two, the determinant, one of the invariant polynomials, um, or the invariant polynomial for the uh, quadratic case, or the n equals two case, is a holomorphic quadratic differential. And from the point of view of Ilana's talk, it's the hop differential of the harmonic map to the symmetric space. Okay? Uh, roughly this psi, if you remember phi plus phi star h, uh, is the tangent map to the harmonic map. Okay, so make sure. Right. And so Hitchin then describes this space uh, of representations in terms of uh, this vibration, which Steve talked about. Maybe I'll draw a picture in the n equals 2 case. So for, for n equals 2, we have a base, which is the uh, quadratic differentials on, uh, on the surface x. And then over each one of these points, there's a prim variety of differentials, um, so some sort of torus. And over some of them, I guess I better do this right, there's some sort of degenerate prim variety. Okay, so this is just a beautiful picture of the space of representations. Um, the, I, there is a certain, there's a detail I'm going to suppress throughout the talk. Going on throughout this, to see whether I decide to mention it, there's a, um, there's a double cover issue. And I'm going to more or less suppress that. Um, and so the, the, the prim variety refers to sort of, just refers to uh, differentials or line bundles that have a certain oddness with respect to this. So. Um, right. Maybe I'll just suppress that, suppress all mention of that. Okay, I want to go forward. Okay, that's not forward. Forward is down. Okay, so there's double cover issues which we're going to suppress. So the, the, the question on the table for the afternoon is what happens when we leave all compact sets in this character variety? So what happens when we um, go to infinity in this space? So here I have some quadratic differential, Q in here, and it is the determinant of one of these phi's. And as I go to infinity, there's lots of ways of going to infinity. I mean, so for example, maybe I'll look at points in this um, character variety for which you know, T times Q0 goes to infinity. So T goes to infinity. I look maybe at a ray of quadratic differentials, and then over that ray, pick out some points in the tori, and they just leave all compact sets in the character variety. And the question is, what's the geometry? Okay. Um, so this happens, for example, when, quadratic, when the Higgs field leaves all compact sets, or when the determinant of the Higgs field, which is this point in the base, goes to infinity. All right, so now, uh, restrict a bit further. We are going, these quadratic differentials are their holomorphic forms on a Riemann surface. They can generically all, so what holomorphic form on a um, holomorphic object is more or less determined by its divisor, more or less determined by its zeros up to a phase. So um, generically, all the zeros are simple. Uh, the, in some sense, the most interesting cases are when they're not, but we're going to focus, we're going to restrict ourselves to the case where somehow all of the zeros, so here um, the Q inverse of zero are all simple. So we're, yeah, okay, zeros are all simple. So, and we're sort of interested in what happens out here in that stratum. Okay. So now we come to a, a recent 
paper of Rafe and his co-authors um, Svoboda, Weiss, and Witt. And they parameterize an end of this character variety in terms of uh, objects they call limiting configurations. So this is phi infinity, A infinity. So now Rafe has to sit on his tongue while I, while I do this. Um, or he can take the or he can take the chalk. So the um, so let me explain. And so I, I, that's really intriguing, right? This sort of analytic description. So let me just say what it is. So here, phi infinity is some sort of Higgs is a Higgs field, and a infinity is a, again a, uni, a unitary connection, as in the um, the d plus a plus phi plus phi star. But it has some singularities at the zeros of Q infinity. These are limiting configurations. They're sort of st they're sitting out here at infinity, so something has to be degenerate, and the degeneration is in the singularities of of a infinity, um, singular at the interesting places of, of the um, at, of the differential at the zeros of Q infinity. And these um, this pair satisfies a limiting decoupled version of Hitchin's equations. Plug in uh, t times phi infinity into the equations, let t, go to inf let t grow large, uh, take a limit, look at the sort of equations you get, and it, I mean, I'm, <laughs> now I'm being obnoxious, uh, the, uh, and distill out of that with quite a bit of thought what the, uh, what the relevant equation should be, and this pair satisfies that, that set of equations. So these are the limiting equation, the limiting version of the equations I didn't show you. Okay, one thing to notice is there's no longer a harmonic map. Right, there's, for for every one of the um, of the representations or the Higgs bundles corresponding to a representation in the variety, we're, we can think about uh, the geometry in terms of this harmonic map to SL2C mod SU2. But as we leave all compact sets, the representations degenerate. There won't be a map left over. And so this is sort of the, one of the extraordinary parts of what gets left out. There is still something which survives, and that's this A infinity. OK. So the, if I should back that up. I can't seem to back that up. OK. So, uh, so this data seems to ca aims to capture the families of degenerating harmonic maps. So what is the moduli space of such pairs? And they, they carefully identify the moduli space. Well, um, the Q infinity, uh, this isn't quite right. Well, kind of, the, the, sorry? And Q infinity, I guess, de, well, determines the, yes, determines the phi infinity. Excuse me, that is right. Um, but. But there's a, a moduli space of A infinities. The same way there's sort of a, a torus of A's over here, over the Q, there's a, there's a prim variety of, of A infinities here. And so maybe uh, we can pick a base one. Maybe we pick the base one, for instance, that uh, has to do with limits in PSL2R sitting inside PSL2C of hyperbolic surfaces inside this um, space of representations. And we can find a new limiting configuration, maybe by looking at the difference between the, some base one and the new one, by adding something, an alpha. And then what is alpha? Alpha is going to be some one form that has some conditions. So alpha is a one form on the punctured, on the surface punctured at the zeros, with values in some, um, some line bundle built out of uh, the phi infinity, and I won't go into the details. Rafe will be happy to explain all the details to you. So L and phi infinity, it's a real line bundle. Um, just to get a definition, it's uh, one forms with values of little su2 that commute with this phi infinity. That's a bunch of matrices. Um, so it's closed form, values that commute. We have to worry about gauge equivalence. Um, if we demand that Alpha is not only one of these deformations in the, in the fiber direction, is not only closed but co-closed, so that it be harmonic. 
it picks out some unique unitary gauge equivalence class. And in the modularized space is the space of these harmonic forms up to a, a lattice of integral periods. So, um, so to, the lattice gives you a quotient, which is a torus. Um, so this m infinity, so now I'm way over here. Maybe I should draw myself another sector over here. And so here's my m infinity. Again, we'll have some phi infinity, which you can think of in some sense as unit Higgs bundles, or maybe the quadrat, the determinant of these bundles has, um, uh, has norm one in some sense. And then over this, there's some um, prim variety of, of forms representing these, uh, these singular connections, A infinity. So um, I'll just summarize. This has been on the slide for a while. Uh, it's a very pretty picture, I think, of the frontier. OK, so here's the questions I want to. I guess, yeah, there are possible. Uh, the alpha will be like differences of of um, of limits of phi's, or di sorry, differences of limits of a's. Okay. So here's the questions I want to talk about. Uh, we're interested in this picture. Imagine this picture as a pic as a um, description as a, the character variety written in some sort of coordinates, why do we have to pick a Riemann surface in the background in order to describe what the limits are? Uh, that seems ad hoc. W what happens to the description if I look at the limit configurations for x, and I look at the, the limiting configurations for x prime, both are describing portions of the frontier, what happens to the description if we change from x to x prime? I'm, presumably, I get new limiting configurations. How do they relate to each other, two sets? The other uh, issue is that we're talking about SL2C mod SU2 um, and surface groups acting on that. This is um, the, the, you know, our, our, our holonomies are in, uh, uh, well, are, are in this quotient. Now, now this is a. Uh, so and so this is a natural space for the Higgs bundle theory, but um, first, for my culture, we don't think of it's, we would call this hyperbolic three space, and there's quite a lot of sophisticated geometry that's been developed for hyperbolic three space. So how do I understand these limiting configurations in terms of that hyperbolic geometry? Okay. So let me switch to the blackboard now. Um, great. So, so let me phrase an answer, or try to answer these questions in terms of what um, interpolates between the flat connection, so the topology, the character variety, and the Higgs fields, the phi's, and that's the harmonic maps, the harmonic uh, metrics in between, so the a, um, the a's in between the d and the phi. So, um, so so I don't. Um, so this stuff is, uh, as I said before, has certain sophistication to it. I think it's very hard to um, to pick up what a Higgs bundle is from um, my treatment, or maybe even Steve's very eloquent treatment if you've never seen it before. Uh, what I, uh, so if you're, if you're discouraged, you can try one more time. I'm sort of going to start again with some other aspects of a different sort of theory. So I want to um, recall just some basic aspects of harmonic maps of surfaces. And actually, to, you can get fairly far in this theory with just um, a couple examples. So harmonic maps of surfaces, maybe I'll say these surfaces have targets in hyperbolic three space. So, um, 
So I just want to describe some examples. Uh, and exa examples of maps from the complex plane to hyperbolic three space. So the first example, um, and I, I suggest that you, you really know a bunch of these examples. Um, so the first example is I want to take C. So here I'll draw C. And then I'll project this. So C, I have a variable Z, X plus I, Y. And then I'll go down to the real part of Z, X. And so now I have the projection onto the real line. And this map is harmonic in any notion of harmonic that you can, uh, you can decide on. And then if I take this real line and I map it to a geodesic in hyperbolic two space, that's an isometry. So this will be a harmonic map followed by an isometry. That had better be harmonic in any definition you'd care to put in. So that's a harmonic map to H2. Um, and of course, I can take H2 and I can stick H2 into H3. And that geodesic will come along. And so this composition of maps will be a harmonic map from C to H3. So I, I, I think that's, I hope that's persuasive, that that's harmonic. Ener locally energy minimizing. Um, so we've had references to the hop differential in a number of guises. Uh, Ilana talked about the hop differential, and I've talked about some quadratic differential, the determinant of the Higgs field. And I alluded to the fact that you could think of the Higgs field as the one zero part of the differential of the harmonic map. So the hop differential is some sort of trace of du squared, or if you like, the trace of phi squared. Or maybe we can think of it as, uh, so I'll call it q. So we can, another way of saying is you can pull back the metric on the target, H3, and you can look at the 2, 0 part of that. That's, uh, that sort of follows from the formulas. And that's supposed to be some quadratic differential. Great. And um, in this case, so that's in general, in this example, uh, what is it? Well, it's going to be, so Q is going to be something times dz squared in the plane. But you know, we can just look at this map and know that, notice that if I translate up and down by C, that doesn't affect the map at all. And if I translate from left to right, it only affects the map by translation along the geodesic. So uh, this quadratic differential, uh, if you think about it in terms of pulling back the metric along this geodesic, is unaffected by translations in any either direction. So that quadratic differential had better just be some multiple of dz squared. Okay. Now, Alex has, has um, highlighted the importance in, when looking at quadratic differentials of horizontal and vertical foliations. So this. Um, so the foliation structure um, of Q, well, that's just going to have horizontal lines that go horizontally, and vertical lines, which go vertically. And you can see how, those, how the, the, the st structure of those foliations, of those leaves, relates to the map. The vertical lines are being collapsed to points, because that's just the projection. And the horizontal lines are going into hyperbolic three space just isometrically to the, along the geodesic. Okay. So once we know this example, it's easy to make other examples. So for instance, now we work backwards. And suppose I have a quadratic differential, which is z dz squared. This is the hop differential for some harmonic map. Which one? Well, now I have a single zero at the origin, and if we work out what are the horizontal and vertical leaves, um, we get some picture that looks like this. So here, one of these leaves is 
the real part. Uh, how do I want to say this? Um, so Q with respect to some direction V is positive. This is the real leaves of the quadratic differential. And so, and now we try to work backwards from this. How, what does the map look like? Well, um, this quadratic differential is on C. So very far away from the origin, if I stand way away from the origin, I become unaware of the zero. The zero is, becomes less prominent, is very far away. So an observer here in the complex plane thinks that the quadratic differential is not z dz squared, but dz squared, 1 times dz squared. There's good local coordinates for that. And so that, so what does the harmonic map look like? Well, it looks like the original example. So way out, so I, if I want to know, say, mapping to H2, what does this map look like? Well, very, very far away, these leaves map to something which is nearly a geodesic, because that quadratic differential is nearly dz squared. And very far over here, it maps to an arc which is nearly a geodesic. And way down here, the same argument happens, and it maps to something which is nearly a geodesic. So altogether, this harmonic map, with, sorry, the harmonic map with this Hopf differential maps to the interior of an ideal triangle. And that's the harmonic map here. Okay? And of course, I can take that ideal triangle. Ideal triangles are rigid. And if I'm mapping to hyperbolic free space, I'll just have an ideal triangle sitting in some plane, sorry, drawer, um, sitting in some plane in hyperbolic free space. Okay? So that's, now, well, we could do two zeros. So that was example one. Let's do two zeros. Uh, I promise I'll stop with two zeros. The rest of the talk won't be. I'll get to five zeros and I run out of time. Um, so if I have two zeros, well, now my foliations maybe look like this. So I'm thinking here about z minus a, z minus b, dz squared. And what does, where does this map to? Well, again, very far away. I start looking you know, like a geodesic. So you can imagine that mapping to hyperbolic two space, um, I'll get something that's roughly four geodesics if I do this right. Now, the problem is that when I put that into H3, I have a different uh, experience that when I put in the ideal triangle. Ideal triangles are rigid. There's only one way to put them into hyperbolic free space. Uh, into a hyperbolic quadrilateral, well, that, let me draw hyperbolic three space in the upper half space model. I can put one of my punctures at infinity. And then, I don't know if this is coming across. I have four distinguished points, and there's a flexibility to four distinguished points. So I don't actually know this map. All I know is that it goes into the convex hull of those four geodesics. However, um, we were interested in asymptotics. I'm interested in when this quadratic differential is very large. So. So I'm not really thinking of z minus a times z minus a times z minus b dz squared, but t times it, where t is very large. So what happens when t is very large? Well, these zeros then, if I start with z minus a times z minus b, they start in, to look like they are very, very far apart. T time, they'll be roughly distance t away from each other. So when t is really, really large, an observer here in the middle is going to think that their quadratic differential is just plain old dz squared. So the image of, of these leaves is going to be very close to the geodesic along the diagonal. And again, harmonic maps have nice convexity properties. They map into the convex hull of their boundary values. 
So since I know that the middle here goes to a geodesic, then what's, or goes near a geodesic, then what happens is the image of the harmonic map maps very close to two ideal triangles joined along a seam, just sort of bent. Okay. okay. Um, Uh, there's a digression that I have. So I want to come back. So the next thread picks up on this two triangles bent along a seam. So, um, so I'll, I'll write it. Two ideal triangles bent along a seam. I can't resist a digression. And for the digression, I might as well come back to um, plain old z dz squared like this. And I told you, so this is out of order. I probably should have done this digression at this point. And, you know, so we've, with, I hope I've convinced you this goes into the, an ideal triangle. And it, the argument I made was way over here you're a geodesic, way over here you're a geodesic, and I drew those two geodesics like this. But the problem is, how about when I traverse from here to here? Uh, and I'm supposed to be very far away from the origin. So this goes to a geodesic. This goes to a geodesic, presumably the same geodesic in some sense. That goes to a geodesic. That goes to a geodesic. So, um, so what has happened is that very far away, I have flipped a solution to this harmonic map equation to the geodesics. It, for a long time, it was very close to this one. And then at some moment, it jumped to another solution to that same harmonic map problem. The original example just took to a geod just took, had image a geodesic. But here, we have to have some sort of flipping phenomenon. And so this is reminiscent of a phenomenon for ODEs called the Stokes phenomenon. And so what's happening here is that as you transition from, from here to here, um, the asymptotic solution jumps. Uh, and all that is really true, one thing I lied about, is that all that is really true is that the forward asymptotics could be prescribed. But the backwards asymptotics couldn't. In some sense, the secondary solution to the differential equation here um, can dominate. The, the, we can have a change in dominance from this solution to the asymptotic uh, equation to this solution. And anyway, it's a, it's a subtle phenomenon that's, that's um, I think, sort of cool. That's a digression. Remind you, two zeros, we get something with a seam. Okay, so let me think about seams for a bit. Okay. So this sort of bent so when you see this sort of bent pair, this bent join of two ideal triangles, um, one is, is led to think about uh, or is reminded of the sort of theory of what are called pleated surfaces, which is a hyperbolic geometric object. Um, so, so from example two, we are reminded of pleated surfaces. So this is a, another fairly complicated object. Um, and so I'm not sure I want, it's either I want to or it is helpful to um, uh, give careful definitions. So let me just approach this by example. So on, so if I have, so if we have 
some quadratic differential q um, on, on x. Uh, uh, it, so it has some sort of foliation structure which I can lift to x tilde on the universal cover, that's complicated. I don't know, something like that. And if I draw that foliation um, on, <laughs> this is supposed to be the, on x tilde, Maybe I think of that as hyperbolic two space. Sorry, I'm not paying for it. So um, one can, you can imagine uh, taking this, these, you can imagine following these leaves as they make their way past obstacles, past other zeros, and they have a limit on the boundary of hyperbolic two space. And one can imagine, I don't see colored chalk. One can imagine straightening them. So between the endpoints of these leaves, there's um, a straightening to geodesic arcs, and um, and when we straighten the geodesic arcs, we arrive at an object associated to the quadratic differential or to the foliation. Um, so this straightening uh, leads us to or produces a so-called geodesic lamination. So uh, this may not be the best way to think of it. So um, and I want to emphasize some stuff that, uh, that Alex has been sort of emphasizing, I think, all week, is that I, I drew this on the universal cover. The uh, these leaves, as they wrap around a Riemann surface, have very complicated dynamics. So maybe I have a zero here on the Riemann surface, but if I follow this leaf, a nearby leaf around, it will sort of wrap all over the Riemann surface, and it may end up coming very, can come back very close to the original zero. So this leaf here may, if I follow it on the Riemann surface, it may find itself near a copy of this zero, or you know a copy of this zero. So the dynamics of these leaves is very, very complicated, and there are copies of this sort of picture all over um, the universal cover. Uh, so, uh, and that's just something worth keeping in mind when you try to imagine harmonic maps based on this or anything. So, this. So returning to the straightening process, if I straighten these leaves that are very close to this, um, uh, maybe to this tripod, then the sort of picture I'll get will be sort of um, a number of ideal triangles with, but because of the dynamics, say, uh, the, uh, the transverse structure of these ideal triangles will have a canter set sort of structure. Okay? You can imagine sort of you, you, um, you follow leaves along and then the leaves come near uh, a zero and then they get split. And then, uh, so if I follow a packet, this packet goes along, the packet comes through here, it splits. The split piece follows along, it hits another zero, it splits. That's sort of a sort of canter set construction that gives uh, a, a one straightened gives geodesics, which also have a sort of canter set transverse structure. Okay. 
So, um, right. So what I'm trying to, what I'm suggesting is that there's a, a geometric, a hyperbolic geometric construction which parallels what we saw here, that quadratic differentials become uh, uh, lead to a collection of geodesics uh, in hyperbolic two space, or in this case hyperbolic three space, um, with complementary domains that um, are uh, hyperbolic. Okay, so what is going, so let me try to summarize this. I'm afraid I've, um, I, I, that wasn't a clear explanation, but I'm, Right, right. if it goes in to just, if I know a priori that it's going into a hyperbolic two space, then yeah, there's no bending. But if all I know is that it's going into hyperbolic three space, and all I know is this um, foliation structure, then no, I, the, uh, I don't really know where it goes at any finite time, but as t gets very, very large, as these zeros get very separated, I can predict that it ends up clinging to a pair of bent triangles. Okay. okay, so so what is a pleated surface? Um, It's, uh, it's, a it's a collection of data where I start with some hyperbolic surface S. So this will be a hyperbolic surface. And uh, I'll have some lamination that will be distinguished. That will be like, so my lamination here is this collection of leaves. It'll be rho equivariant with respect to some representation. So this is a lamination. And there'll be some map F. And the point with F is that it'll have two properties. It will be, um, so off of the lamination, uh, F is an isometry. And on the lamination, um, F is an isometry of the lamination, of the leaves. So it's not, I, isometries, you know, ten, uh, uh, so, so here I'm referring to an isometry that's rank two. It takes the tangent plane isometrically on the tangent plane. Here I'm referring to, so F is an isometry of the lamination. The picture is this. On the universal cover, I have, oops, some, some lamination which has, uh, was complementary domains maybe look like ideal triangles. This gets mapped, so this is equivalent to H2. This gets mapped into H3 in a way that bends along the lamination. Off of the lamination is an isometry, so its, its image on each one of these pieces is somehow straight. It's pieces of hyperbolic two space, and then, but on, but on the leaves, it's only an isometry along the leaf. There's no transverse is isometry, so this can bend, and this is a very hard picture to draw because I'm trying to draw bending along a canter set. But it looks something like that, and you can see it's sort of pleated, so it's a pleated surface. Okay. Yes, SL2C. So does the F, so does the H3. Goes to H3. Oh, I'm sorry. So F tilde takes me from the universal cover, if you like, H2 to H3. Thank you. Okay. And that's the bending. There's one feature to notice about this, which is that, um, so, so how do you make a pleated surface? So I can take, um, I don't know, 
maybe I'll, I'll just think about taking a pair of ideal triangles and mapping them in. And um, I have a couple parameters to keep track of. One is I can keep track of the bending angle. Okay, so they can go in along some angle. The other thing you can do is, remember, along the geodesics, along, along this arc, I only need to take this, this geodesic to a geodesic parameterized by arc length. So one can also shear. So I can take this ideal triangle, I have a pair of, once I've bent, I can take that one ideal triangle, another ideal triangle, and shear one against the other. That maintains the bending angle, um, but it is a somewhat different picture. There is, in some sense, there are natural feet here, and so one can very much uh, either keep the feet at the same relative distance or displace them. So there's some amount of shearing. And shearing and bending are the basic operations you can do to a pleated surface. Okay, so uh, that's the data. Here's our results. What do I have? Thank you. Good. I can see it here. It's perfectly good. Let's try. Sorry? OK. So what I'm going to do now is tell you our results. There we go, which I put on slides because they're so long to state. Um, so the, the first result is this, again, with my collaborators, Otz, Boboda, and Richard Wentworth. So we let the representations tend to a limiting configuration. Remember limiting configurations? Um, from, um, uh, Matthias, Svoboda, Weiss, and Witt of earlier in the talk. And let UT be the corresponding harmonic map. So it's UT is, UT is rho T equivariant. Suppose our lamination, let lambda phi infinity, be the straightening of this horizontal foliation. So I move from foliations to laminations by some natural geometric process, which I did a poor job explaining. Okay. Um, then, there is a pleated surface in space, which is a row equivariant for some row, some other row, so that if I want to know what the image of that harmonic map is, I, I take this pleated surface and I shear it exactly by, by roughly t to the half. So, and one can track this family of representations heading towards that limiting configuration by uh, building a pleated surface out of phi infinity and then shearing that surface with t. And the, as t gets very, very large, you get closer, the image of the harmonic map gets closer and closer to the sheared pleated surface. So it's very much like this picture here, where the harmonic map gets very close to some sort of bent picture. So that's structural result number one. So to a limiting configuration, we have a, a pleated surface, or more precisely, a sort of shearing class of pleated surfaces. I don't actually know which one we're starting with. But. Energy, the equivariant energy of the harmonic map. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Maybe I misunderstood, but it could have sounded before that you were alluding that maybe any harmonic map um, would be I really need, well, remember I said here that as when t is very large, then the points here start thinking they are mapping to geodesics. But the keywords are when t is very large, or when the distance is very large. So I'm really, when I said this, I was thinking of a quadratic differential that's t times z minus a times z minus b. So something that's, um, uh, that's, that's very far out in quadratic differential space. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're, I got more results. Okay. So first is there's a pleated surface. Okay. So in short, harmonic maps are well approximated by pleated sur by shearings of pleated surfaces. Along some lamination, you build out of um, out of an, out of the hop differential, but 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 not so much the complex the complex structure is going to go away. We're really interested in, the, in a topological feature of the hop differential. We're interested in that foliation. So the Riemann surface is not so relevant. Yeah. You get a different quadratic differential. We're, we're coming to this. Well, let me, let me, let me give you a partial answer. I'll give you a partial answer. Um, looking, at my, looking at my watch as if I care about time. So that the, um, it creates the illusion of concern for the audience that the, um, the quadratic differential gives a, the horizontal foliation is a measured foliation. It's a topological object. So um, the other, f when I change x to x prime, I can find a quadratic differential q prime whose horizontal measured foliation is the same. So what is, the point is what is relevant here is the topological aspect of the quadratic differential that relates to the Riemann surface and not so much else. We're coming, okay. Now I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna move on. Just give me a moment. Okay, and so now, what about the bending angle? I, I'm, I, I hope I'll answer your question by, in the next minus three minutes. So, um, again, we might have two limiting configurations, phi infinity, A0 infinity. If you like, think of this as Fuchsian, or just think of this as some base point. And another one, which was alpha away from it in terms of these limiting configurations, in terms of these one forms with values in this real line bundle, okay? Um, now, one of these, these are one forms, and I can check that, um, that if we're on a Riemann surface and I have a zero, P and Q, so P and Q, that's bad notation, P and, uh, and R um, are in the zero set of the quadratic differential Q, I can check that if I integrate along a path between P and R, um, that and remember, each one of these points is a zero, so each one is going to an ideal triangle in this sort of bent lamination. So this path is developing to some path on this pleated surface. And I can check that, that, that the integral formally defines um, a bending cocycle. This is now technical, but it formally defines a, a way of describing the bending of a pleated surface. Okay? It measures the total bending of an arc. So with that, so therefore alpha determines two pleated surfaces from two different perspectives. The first one is I can take my original pleated surface associated to that limiting configuration, and I can use alpha and this bending data to bend it. Okay, so now I have a uh, I have a pleated surface that way just by taking a one pleated surface and bending it more. The other point is that A0 infinity plus alpha is a limiting configuration. So it is, it is a limit of representations. So it also corresponds to a shearing class of pleated surfaces. So that's another pleated surface, which I wrote sigma sub alpha here to be cute. Um, that arises from the first proposition. So we have two pleated surfaces associated to this alpha. Okay? And so the theorem is they're the same thing. So, um, so, so alpha really is, so alpha here is representing the bending of the pleated surfaces that are associated to, um, uh, to these limiting configurations. Now, the point is that, um, when I'm talking about shearing and bending, I'm no longer referring to the background Riemann surface X, the, the domain 
of the harmonic maps, the fixed object on which we built the Higgs bundles. So um, forget that. Nope, maybe I should say. Oh, one way of reading this theorem is that um, these alphas, these harmonic forms, are, it's a sort of Hodge theory result. They're, they're in some sense harmonic representatives of bending co-cycles. So these topological objects, you give me a Riemann surface and now I find a harmonic version of those bending co-cycles. Okay, uh, let me not tell you the proof. I'll say that in a minute. And so now if we slightly change x to x prime, what happens to this description of limiting configurations? Well, phi infinity will change to phi infinity prime but those will share the same vertical measured foliation. That'll be the, by the construction that comes out of it. And alpha will change to some other alpha prime, but, uh, you know, but the bending is already fixed geometrically. So these alpha and alpha prime have to have the same periods. Oh, there's a missing technical hypothesis here on the quadratic differentials that I'm not gonna talk about. Um, so, the point is that this gives us some topological description of some of the generic limiting configuration, independent of the choice of background Riemann surface, and and I'll stop. Does anybody have a question for the speaker? Uh, so, then where did you use the simple zeros in this stuff? Why are they so important for the Um. Well, there's a, we were talking about limiting configurations, which are um, defined for gene, in the generic stratum. Okay. So uh, certain parts of this theory work fine. In other words, um, there is, right, um, this sort of description of you go far out and you get uh, things that look like geodesics, that works fine. And so you have some, um, you find some surface which uh, has boundaries which are geodesics. As Scott points out, if it's an ideal tri, if it has a simple zero, then you, there's only one possibility for those complementary domains those are ideal triangles. Uh, but in general, you might have, um, you, you can still sort of talk about, you know, have some control on the harmonic maps. And in particular, you know, there's one of the questions here, I, for many people, is, um, you know, what happens at the higher order zero case? And one can sort of imagine that what happens is in the, um, as Superjoy brings up, the, uh, in the case where the, um, if you start with uh, an SL2R representation, so you're mapping to H2, and so your pleated surface is not bent at all, it just all lives inside a hyperbolic two space, which can't be bent. Um, let's see. And then you start to, to bend. You might leave a, a hyperbolic ideal quadrilateral which would correspond to a second order zero. And then the sort of ways that the two different frontiers would fit together, maybe, possibly, I don't know, would be, you know, you, if I insert a diagonal in, in one of two ways, neither bend this way or bend that way. But um, that's the uh, higher co-dimension strata, and you have to build those and fill it in and, and glue things together. Is that an answer? Sure. More questions? I'm not sure if this one makes sense, but the, how much interesting translation do you see in the representation of the um, I have to, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure what an acceptable answer is. Um, well, oh, okay. So. There's a description of, okay, so there's a number of ways of saying this. Um, here's one way. So there's a, a, 
a famous compactification of the representation variety by real trees due to um, Morgan and Shalin. Okay? So what is going on there? So <clears throat> what is happening there is that um, they're looking at lengths. At, uh, you take a collection of curves, a gen nice kind of generating set for pi 1 on the, on the Riemann surface. And under the representation, if you're leaving all compact sets in a representation variety, some of those curves are getting very, very long. So one can look at like the projective limit. So <clears throat> what is hap and so the the harmonic map we know is respecting this representation. It's the harmonic map is becoming like a pleated surface. So what is happening to these curves? Well, uh, this is I don't know how well I can draw this, but um, if I'm looking at a curve whose uh, who's, uh, which lifts or which you know, starts here and here's another point in the orbit and it you know, makes its way from here to here, well then what happens is you can represent it by a curve which does something like that. Now remember I'm shearing a lot. So from here to here along the foot of the geodesic, along the foot of the triangle, that's always bounded. Ideal triangles, there's only one ideal triangle. This has length 1.3, some number. Then from here to here, it's like t to the half times the vertical measure. And so here it's t to the half times the vertical measure over there. So one can predict the lengths of these curves. And from this, one learns that the morgan shaled compactification by real trees is exactly what you get by projecting this foliation down to its leaf space. All right, so you sort of see the leaves here. So this projects to, I don't know if I can do it right, you know, some, some tree. The issue is that uh, when you do that, you have collapsed all these tori, these compact things, to nothing because we're only looking at the quadratic differentials. So what the pleated surfaces do is somehow refine the morgan shalin compactification by inserting these sort of bendings. Okay. Another feature, which I'll, I, I, we have to stop, I know. I'll release the prisoners in a moment. The, um, uh, so Francis Bonahan has a very sophisticated theory of, of fleeted surfaces. And he has a description of some portion of the frontier that is reminiscent of this, uh, where he fixes a maximal lamination. So lamination where all the complementary domains are ideal triangles. And he parametrizes the end or the space in terms of bendings and shearings along that lamination. So this is some version of, um, and that will work for any lamination, any one of these laminations. So this is somehow like a diagonal version of that. Um, maybe I'll just shut up now. Let's thank Michael again for his nice talk. Okay.